to Jesus is an exciting time in his presence. Today is the 25th day of December. It's Christmas already. What a glorious time in his presence. Just like yesterday. We are already in the 25th day of December 2020. It's a day of celebration. It's a joyous moment. Every Christmas, every 25th of December, we gather to hear what God is going to say about the one single event that altered the course of life, of the world, forever before his coming his birth we had bc after he came it changed it became anno domino in the year of the lord and that has not changed since then the entire course of history the direction the focus of the human race changed completely today we want to look at something that has to do with christmas what was that gift that Christmas, the birth of Jesus, gave to us? That's what we want to look at this morning. Let's let's have our seat, please. Welcome us to Rema Grace Ecclesia today. It's an exciting time in the presence of God. It's a day to celebrate. It's a day to rejoice and be glad in it. That's what scripture says. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, we are taking our introduction from Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 this morning. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. A child is born, but the son is given. That shows you that there is a distinction between sonship and childhood. Nobody is born, born again, a son in the real sense in the kingdom of God. You have to grow. That's why 1 Peter 2.2 2 talks about as newborn babes, desire the sincere meek of the world that ye may grow so that you can grow. So, a child is born in the natural realm so also when we are born again we are born again children babes so we need to grow into sonship for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace these are all the titles addressed to our lord jesus the child that is born and the son that is given he is called in case you are getting it confused he is called wonderful he is the counselor he is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. Because sometimes people get confused. What's the difference between Jesus and God? What's the difference between the Holy Spirit and God? There are no three different persons. Jesus talked about his Father in heaven. Does the work. I am my Father, I am one. And he says the Father that lives in me does the work. And they clearly you see that the Holy Spirit does the work. So it is one and the same being that manifests itself in three different distinct forms. The Father, the
the Spirit, the Word, and the Word became flesh and took on the form of Jesus, took the name Jesus. So he is the same person. Don't get it confused. Christmas. Christmas. What we are looking today is Christmas, the mystery of godliness revealed. This is a very touching subject in the Christendom today. The issue of godliness. You know, many times we do a lot of things that something has been preached for so long doesn't mean it is right. It is time we start checking the scriptural legality of some of the sermons and the doctrines that we parade in the various church denominations. Christmas, the mystery of godliness revealed. You will be amazed what godliness, the definition of godliness. First of all, I will tell you what godliness is not using the scriptures. Then before I will tell you what godliness is. When you understand that Christmas centers around this godliness, Christmas gave us godliness. The birth of Jesus gave us godliness. But what is godliness? Do we think godliness is something that is so simple and understanding? Everybody knows it. You see it. You understand it. I'm going to show you a scripture today that will shock you. Because we have used this word so much. And I got to discover from my deep studies with the Holy Spirit that we, 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 we really do not even have an understanding of what the word godliness means. So for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. You see that? The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Did you see that? What is the function of the Holy Spirit? In John's Gospel 14, John's Gospel 15, John's Gospel 16, he said he will guide you. That's the work of a counselor. Did you see that? So from Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, you will see the names of the three manifestations of God. As a counselor, that's how the Holy Spirit was revealed by Jesus in John's gospel chapter 15. However, when he, the spirit of truth, the Allos Paracletos will come, he will guide you into all truth. That's the work of a counselor. Then he not addresses his address as the everlasting father. It's complete, right? There is the Holy Spirit. His own function, his own title, as a counselor, the one who guides. Then there is the everlasting father. He didn't say the temporary father. He says the everlasting father. That is, this title of his does not change. There's never a time he's going to stop being the everlasting father. And there is never a time he's going to stop being the mighty God. There's never a time he's going to stop being the Prince of Peace. Now listen carefully. Don't approach spiritual matters with your brain because it's going to explode. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Because the more you look at these titles, these various nomenclature, if you look at it through your head, through your mind, you get confused. You get blown away. The Prince? How can he be a Prince and be the Mighty God? How can he be a Prince and be the Wonderful Counselor? The Wonderful, the Counselor. How can he be a prince and be the same time the everlasting father? Yes, that's why he's God. Almighty. The one with the infinite mindset. We have finite mindset. And that is why we need to open up our spirit man to receive light. This morning you're going to get light. Light that is going to set you on a path and make 2021 a better year for you. Because I have seen that most often than not, you are as you feel cool with yourself most times until you stand in front of the mirror. Do you know sometimes it is possible for you to eat? You are finished eating, you didn't know that you drop oil on your shirt, and then you stand before the mirror to do the final thing, and then you say, oh My goodness, what is this? You were happy until you stood before the mirror. But I'm going to show you one mirror today that if you as a believer stand before it, you'll be ecstatic with joy. Christmas, the mystery of godliness revealed. Look at it. First of all, let me show you what godliness is not. 1 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 7 to 10. 
And this is where we base our definition of what godliness is, and it's an error. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 7 to 10. Christmas, the mystery of godliness. Don't forget, I use the word mystery. Mystery means a secret. Mystery means something hidden. Mystery means when they give you that thing, you think you know what it is, but you really don't until it is unfolded. It's like a gift that is wrapped. You know, many times people want to guess, it is this, it is that. Then when they open it, all of the guesses you all give, none of them is right. Yeah, that is a mystery. Because the presenter deliberately wrapped it up to understand, that, to make sure that you cannot know what it is until he or she tells you or shows you what it is. Praise God. Amen. Wherefore, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. See that? In bracket, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. The word verity means truth, 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 truthfulness, truth. Verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Listen on, lifting up holy hands. Did you see that? First of all, you have a problem with that. You who don't believe that you are even holy or righteous, how can your hand be holy when you lift it up? Are you saying, is there, is there a hand that is holy? Yes. That's what the Bible just said. I would that men pray everywhere. Lifting up what? Holy hands, not defied hands. Because what makes the, the hand holy or not holy is not from the hand. It comes from somewhere else. It is from the heart. Not the physical heart. It comes from the spirit man, the nature of the person. That's why Jesus said something. He said, when you make the inner part of the cup clean. The whole cup is clean. And can you recall the encounter with uh, Peter? When Peter said Jesus would not wash him. No, I will not allow you to wash him. Me. And Jesus said, And Jesus said, If I don't wash you, you will not be a part of me. Then Peter said, No, 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 no. Don't just wash my hands and my feet. Wash the whole of me. So what did Jesus say? Jesus said, no, the one that has been washed already is clean. You are clean every week from head to toe. So you don't need to do all of that. Now look at it. I will that therefore men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Did you see that? See the word, without wrath and what? Doubting. Because many times, take note of the word, holy hands. Your hand is holy because your nature is holy. Your hand cannot be holy if your nature is not holy. Are you following the simple analysis this morning? Christmas, the mystery of godliness revealed. He said, I would that men everywhere lifting up what holy hands. You see, when we read it, we tend to skip the word holy. It's agios. Agios means the most holy thing, the most holy one. The same very title God bears. The same very title the Holy Spirit bears. Agios. Agios. He said, lifting up holy hands. Your hand is holy because your nature is holy. And not because that is the human nature. It is the nature of God that is inside of you. Praise God this morning. Amen. In like manner also that women adorn themselves. Look at that. In modest apparel. In modest apparel. It didn't say in outdated apparel. It said modest apparel. With shamefacedness and sobriety. I'm going somewhere with shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with broided hair. Or gold, or pills, or costly array, but it said in bracket, which becometh women professing godliness, which becometh women professing godliness. Now listen, now look at it. It says, but with good works. But in bracket, it says, which become women professing godliness. Now, what did I say? I said, I will first tell you what godliness is not. Now, in those days in the church, and even now, godliness seemed to be decided or seemed to be pegged or pinned on physical, something physical. 
something materialistic. Now look at this. These women, there are a group of women in the church that Timothy pastored who believe that prosperity is a sign of godliness. That that's the definition of godliness. You might be wondering, what's the apostle saying this morning? So to them, godliness is prosperity. So if, if you are blessed and you are prospered, you dress, it shows godliness. That was their idea. That was a definition of what godliness is. He said, which become women professing godliness. But Paul said, no, no, it should be by works. So Paul had not defined godliness. So he was just putting in order what the behavior, what the structure would now. Why in those days, the church believed that godliness is when you are blessed and you dress well, you dress expensively, particularly for the women folks, but today, the opposite is the case. There are many denominations who preaches and teaches that godliness is when you look shabby, when you dress shabby, when you look unkept. That means you don't, you don't, you don't look nice. Now look at it. It's a clear contrast to what the women believed in those days. We had how, how they have to dress gay and I mean, look gayish. You understand? Beautiful, mega, expensive. And Paul was saying that's not the focus. That's not what godliness is all about. Are you getting the point? So I'm giving you the two extremes. What was in the church days, in the early church days, and what is today. That's why you have ministries like Mountain of Fire and Miracles, uh, ministries like Deeper Life. Now see the way they dress. The thing that is what it is. That is modest. They don't put on jewelry. They don't put on expensive clothes. Well, except for their women because their men seem to put on these things. You know, they look very expensive. But let me shock you. Let me give you a shocker. The clothing that you will put on in heaven will be one, will be more expensive than the richest man's wealth on earth here. Ask me how. Why? Because the Bible says that this very street is made up of pure gold. Ask yourself, which one do you place more emphasis on? The ground you walk on or the clothes you wear and the building you live in? Now you have an idea. So if the streets in heaven is made up of pure gold. I just had a brother who just went to heaven on the 22nd of this same month. Pure gold. Now, it doesn't matter how he lived here. He, 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 it doesn't matter the kind of clothing he put on here. It pales into insignificance for the clothing that he appears with in heaven. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, godliness is not about what you wear or what you don't wear. Godliness is not about how expensive or not expensive the clothing you put on. So you see, Paul, through Timothy, rebuked the church and said, Hey, listen, you are missing it. You are missing it. You don't tie prosperity to godliness. No, not necessarily. Don't, try, don't, don't tie your clothing. How you look, your appearance to godliness. No, 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 no. It's a different thing. What's the te title of, of the sermon? Christmas. Colon. The mystery of godliness revealed. Did I just say godliness is a mystery? So if I say it's a mystery, then it means it's a secret. If it's a secret, then it means today let's unravel. Because the gift of Christmas. Somebody is wondering, how does... Christmas connect to godliness. What's the apostle teaching this morning on a Christmas day? How does godliness tie to the birth of Jesus? Christmas. Well, the word godliness in the Greek is the word Theosebahaya. Theosebahaya. That is the Greek word godliness. Theose Bahaya. T H E O S E B E I A. Pronounce Theose Bahaya. Theose Bahaya. You know what Theose Bahaya means? Oh, hold on. 
It means reference towards God's goodness. Godliness, the word translated good godliness, the word Theosep Bahia in the Greek, translated godliness in English, means a reference for the goodness of God. Now look at it. Listen carefully. What is reference? Reference is simply is reverence. It means gratitude. It is gratitude for the goodness of God. Now the question is this. What is the goodness of God? So you see that is why if you dress gaily or you dress shabbily, if you dress expensively or you don't dress expensively, that's not what godliness is. It is reverence, gratitude for God's goodness. So this was what those women in those days felt. God has been great to me. God has blessed my family so well. And that's the reason why I live a good life. I live a prosperous life. That is what godliness is. Well, that is not what godliness is. And this morning you need to know what godliness is. Your clothing is not godliness. Your nakedness is not godliness either. That's the truth. Theosep Bahia is a reverence for God's goodness. Now the question is this. What does it mean in the Greek? What is the God's goodness that is being referred to? If you unlock what the God's goodness is being referred to, you will, you will unlock what the meaning of godliness is. Are you ready with the apostle this morning? Uh, come on, let's dive in then. First Peter chapter 1 verse 10 to 12. I'll, I'll try to make the sermon as brief as possible this morning. Christmas, the mystery of godliness revealed. This message, simple, straightforward, is going to set you up for the year 2021. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired. Listen, oh, salvation. Don't forget the word salvation. The word Jesus. They mean basically the same thing. The word Joshua. Yehoshua. The salvation of the Lord. That's what Joshua means. Joshua means. That's what Jesus means. Okay. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. The word that should come was written in italics. It's written in italics. So it is actually who prophesied of the grace unto you. So not to come is already here. Verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things, take note, which things the angels desire to look into. What were the angels so desire, so desirous of? What, what was their enthusiasm all about? They have been in the presence of God for eternity. They don't know how God looked like. They've been in his presence. Yet they can't tell you the shape of God, the identity of God, what he looks like. They cannot tell you. So when this prophecy of Isaiah that we started with, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and they began to hear the name. So it dawned on them that that was the Holy One that they've been with in heaven. You can imagine their curiosity. They needed to see what he looks like. I'm going somewhere. They needed to see what he looks like. 
up till that time, the definition of godliness was something else. When Christ showed up on earth, he came with that vocabulary, godliness. I'll show you from the scripture. He came with the, before Christ, the vocabulary godliness, by that definition that I'm going to show to you now, which I've shown you, uh, Tiosa Bias. Yep. Tiosa Bias didn't exist. Non-existent. By that definition. So, no wonder the people, women were confused. People were not creating their own definition of what godliness is. God has blessed me so much. Therefore, I live and I display the affluent. This is godliness. Beautiful. All right. So, let's go to Matthew. I'm taking it gradually. Then I'm going to give you drop the bomb shortly. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 20 to 23. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 20 to 23. But while he thought on these things, behold, this, talking about Joseph and Mary now. Behold, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Did you remember that we said that angel desired to look into these things in First Peter we just read? Good. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Did you see that? That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Is Jehovah is salvation. Now all this was done. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, God with us. Look at it. Up to that point in time, that name had not been known. Emmanuel, God with with us Emmanuel God with us so you see that the coming of Christ created new vocabularies on earth one of them is godliness which I'm going to show you shortly now this Emmanuel God with us is tied to it directly let me not drop the bomb first Timothy Emmanuel don't forget Emmanuel God with us how is he with us how is God with us don't forget, God has always been with the Jews, right? Yeah, but how was he with them? He was with them in the form of angels. He was with them in the form of cloud. Pillar of cloud. Pillar of fire. Yeah, that was how he was with them. But he said, God with us. So, how is God going to be with us now? We are going to the unraveling of the mystery of godliness. He was with them then. That was not the capture of godliness. Now he's with us in a different form. Different from the form he was with them in the Old Testament. Are you getting the apostle this morning? First Timothy chapter 3. Oh, I'm excited. Glory to Jesus. It's Christmas morning. First Timothy chapter 3 from verse 14 to 16. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. You know, many of us don't know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And look at verse 16. Are you ready? Theosi Bahia is coming up again. Theosi Bahia is coming up again. And without controversy. Are you ready? Without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. Did you see that? Did you see that? Without controversy, great is the mystery of God. So godliness is a mystery. The mystery is a secret. We thought we knew what godliness is. We are running around. 
Deeper lifers don't dress well. Putting on slippers. Putting on sandals. Saying that shoe is from the wall. But even the slippers is also made in the wall. So you see, why those women of old believe that when you dress heavily, expensively, that is godliness. We have people in our day, denominations, who believe if you dress expensively, that is worldliness. So the opposite, therefore, is godliness. They are both wrong. Because the Bible calls godliness what? A mystery. Oh, glory to Jesus. It was Paul who first wrote to them in 1 Timothy chapter 1, right? Chapter 2. Now he's not bringing it up in chapter 3 to give the decoding of what he first says. See, the revelation of Jesus, the revelation of God to us is progressive. He dropped that. He didn't stop there. Another aspect, version, was coming. An update was coming again. Look at it. He said, without controversy. That means after I revealed this to you, if you have problem with defining godliness, you are a moron. Because it says without what? Controversy. You don't dispute this that is about to be revealed. If you are in disputation, if you dispute this, I said you are what? A moron. Verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery. So, Kiyose Bahaya, Kiyose Bahaya, it's a mystery. What is the mystery? If you look at the end of godliness, you will see two dots. It's a colon. That colon means what is coming up now is explaining what is on the left-hand side. That's a colon. Can you see the colon there? Yeah, we are going to school this morning. You see, at the end of godliness, you have the two dots there. That's colon. That's the definition of godliness. What's the definition of godliness? God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into heaven. So what is godliness? Emmanuel. That's why I said take note of Emmanuel. What is godliness? Emmanuel. God manifest in the flesh. So that's why I said there was no godliness until Jesus appeared. It was a new vocabulary. No godliness until Jesus appeared. That word godliness didn't appear. Was non-existent until Jesus appeared physically. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifests in the flesh. Listen, he didn't say God manifested to flesh. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Listen to the apostle. He didn't say God manifested to the flesh. He said God manifested in the flesh. That means God appeared in flesh. He said that is godliness. Not your expensive clothes or your non-expensive clothes. Not your expensive jewelries or your non-expensive jewelries. Not whether you put on earrings or you don't put on earrings. Too much ignorance in the church. And we are pushing the return of Jesus far away. Because it's not coming for an ignorant church. Ephesians 4. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Till we all grow to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ Jesus. So the more the church is peddling and swimming in ignorance, the more she's pushing further the return of Jesus. It's coming for a vibrant church, not a lukewarm church. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in what? The flesh. So the first definition now look at it. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, not by the church definition. To be justified is to be declared righteous. To be justified is to be declared righteous. God manifests in the flesh and justified what? In the spirit. 
So godliness is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. Praise God. Godliness is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. And where there is godliness, you find righteousness and holiness. They go together. God was manifest in the flesh. So guess the first godliness we saw on earth. The baby Jesus. Praise God this morning. I'm excited. The first God. I said the first because we have millions of godliness all over the earth now. And I'm one of them talking. Glory to Jesus. If you are born again, you are one of us. Glory to Jesus. So the first godliness that was ever seen was Jesus. God in the flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. Angels wanted to see what it is. Can we truly see his form and see what he looks like? When they saw the baby, you saw Peter, he said, in which things angels desire to see. They wanted to see what it looks like. Godliness is God manifest in the flesh. I'll take it further and show you another scripture that will help you understand. What is that goodness of God to us? Teosabaya, reverence, gratitude for God's goodness. What is that God's goodness? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Our problem is that we have taught certain portion of the Bible negative. We only read them when we want to give negative message. That's why I'm taking you to one of them that people used to give out negative message. And I want to give the most positive message out of it. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body, did you see that? Your body, your body, your body. Glory to Jesus. Know ye not that your body, my body, is the temple, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Know ye not that your own very body. So, Jesus' body as a baby is not the only one that God manifests in. Glory to Jesus. He says if you are born again and you have Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, you are the very definition of godliness. It's got nothing to do with what you wear, what you don't wear. It's got nothing to do with the jewelries you put on or you don't wear. There is too much ignorance in many church denominations. That's what Jesus said of the Pharisees. If the blind lead the blind, they will both fall into the dishes. You come and see how people will be weeping and crying over the issue of godliness. And they are preaching a sermon on it. And all their sermon on godliness borders down on what you wear or what you don't wear. How you look or how you don't look. What a shame. Godliness is a mystery. The mystery has been revealed. It's been decoded. So Christmas, the mystery of godliness revealed. Godliness is God manifest in the flesh. In other words, your body becomes the temple. The Greek word temple is naos. Naos means a sacred edifice. Now, do you know what that means? Think of the temple in Jerusalem. A, pl a place, a building that has been wholly dedicated to God. Where God comes down. But your own body is different. God doesn't come down. That's where he dwells. Glory to Jesus. The Bible says in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Why do we only preach this part of portion when we want to talk of fornication? That's not the message the Holy Ghost was, was communicating. He's telling you how important you are. How your body has become something else. Your body is no longer just mere body. Your body is now a temple. It's a sacred ed edifice. When you say something is sacred, it means the thing is holy. It is untouchable. You cannot dent it. It is special. It is a monument. It's an edifice. Something that is pure. Something that is very important. It's like you are talking about the seven wonders of, 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 of the world. Think of something like that. When you say this thing is sacred, that means it is special. So God is saying your body is special. Why? Because I dwell in it now. You don't pray for godliness. You become godliness. Praise God. Have you seen where Christians are play, praying for godliness? To be godly? I'm talking about born again people. So much ignorance. So this Christmas, the gift the Holy Spirit is giving to the church is the gift of godliness. Letting you know you are godly. Now it said God manifests in the flesh. Justified by who? 
the church doctrine. No, justified by the pastor saying, if you are putting on a, a wivon, it means you are not holy. Why are we subjecting ourselves to people who have no business even teaching us? No, I'm saying that with all seriousness. These guys don't even know what they are teaching. Now, the Bible said in Timothy, desiring to be teachers, they never know what they are saying. And if you have people listening to such people, it's double wahala. Praise God. He said, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh, justified what? In the spirit, not in your body, not by your church doctrine. Not by the rules and regulations. Not by somebody telling you in this church we don't use Wivon. Which church? Do you have a church? The church belongs to Jesus. Godliness is God inhabiting your very body. And where godliness is, holiness and righteousness follow. That's why it said God manifests in the flesh and the Holy Spirit justified this. Why? The Holy Spirit gave it legality and said, yeah, this is possible. Because up to that point in time, God had never taken flesh. I'll, I'll say that again. Up to that point where God took on the form of a baby, a body, a mortal body, God had never taken flesh. In the Old Testament, the higher the Holy Spirit come upon, it wasn't in them. He comes upon and finishes his work, he leaves. Because if he tarries too long, the people will die. Yeah, his presence will kill them. But do you see God successfully is living inside of you and he doesn't have any qualms? No problem. That's because something has changed. Your nature has truly changed. These are the truths, the revelation that we should teach the people of God and equip them so we can raise an army, not in besides. Feed and equip the people with truth. Raise an army for the kingdom. We are raising imbeciles. Because we are giving them half truth that are lies. Godliness is God making your body inhabitable for him. And once you are born again, that is the definition. That is the pathway to godliness. It is you accepting Jesus as your Lord. Your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is Teosa Bahaya. Tiosa Bahaya. So look at it now. So reference for God's goodness. So you see, we live our life every day in gratitude. That you mean is me be this? Is me be this? You mean God dwells inside of me right now. Father, I am grateful. How could I have been worthy for this? He made you worthy. So you see why when he says in everything give thanks because it is the will of God that God can dwell inside you and you can't die. The Israelite cannot even stand the presence of the ark of God. The ark is a standard box. They couldn't stand it. The holy of holies, when the high priest is entering, he doesn't know whether he's going to die inside there or come out. But you carry the Holy Ghost everywhere you go. Glory to Jesus. You carry God about. When you are sleeping, he's sleeping. When you go to pee, he goes to pee. When you are in the toilet, he's in the toilet. When you are in the car, he's in the car. When you are in your office, he's in the office. When you go to the market, God goes with you. God goes wherever you go. That is a scenario that should elicit our gratitude for all eternity. So godliness, Tiosa Bahaya, is reverence for the goodness of God. What is that goodness? That God now counts your body worthy for him to dwell in it. That's why he said, the reason you are allowing your body to be messed up is because you don't have any idea what it is. Are you getting what I'm saying? Your body is sacred now. It doesn't matter what you feel like. Think of a shrine. It's not everything you can take to the shrine, right? It's not, it's not everything you can take to the shrine. Because it is sacred. So therefore, you follow the rules and the regulation that allows you to take things to the shrine. Your body is God's shrine. Praise God. Hallelujah. Shouldn't that elicit gratitude? That is what godliness is. It is reverence for his goodness. And that goodness is that your body has become his temple. That he indwells. 
So you see, every individual will express that gratitude in the way they like. Church, stop forcing members to express that gratitude in a particular way. If that sister chooses to put on with Vaughn, that's how she wants to express gratitude. Stop being busybody. Let them live their life for God. You didn't die for them. Jesus died for them. You are not the Holy Spirit that is their guide. It is the Holy Spirit. Busybody, mind your business. Your business is to teach them the gospel, not your belief. Stop teaching them your opinion. Christmas, the mystery of godliness revealed. Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Did you see that? The temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, in you, which ye have of God. Did you see that? And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are what? God's. So both your body and your spirit, they are God. How do you show him gratitude? Show him gratitude with your body. Show him gratitude with your spirit. Do you see this simple message you preach? You don't, I don't need to shout and say, don't commit fornication. This is the one I should preach. Once I present this to you, you know how privileged you are that he chose your body to be a sacred temple. God is dwelling comfortably inside of me. It's a privilege I won't take for granted. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's why it's not everything I put in this body. Because every shrine has its own rules and regulations. Every sacred monument has things you cannot do there. Because I know that I have become God's shrine. Glory to Jesus this morning. You have become God's mobile shrine. So therefore there are rules. Praise God. Hallelujah. There are things I cannot put in this shrine. There are things I shouldn't put in it. There are things I shouldn't put in this shrine. And how do I know those things? The Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Praise God. Hallelujah. He will guide you into all truth. What we do, we point you in the right direction. And the Holy Spirit takes over. It's a problem when we write book and tell church everything they will do and how and what they will not do. It is wrong. Don't take over the Holy Spirit position. Jesus never said the Allos Paracletos and the pastor. He never said the Allos Paracletos and the president and founder. That's not what he said. He said the Allos Paracletos, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth, including the pastor. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's the reason why I see why many pastors don't get revelations from God. I see the reason why many pastors don't hear from God. This sermon dropped last night. Last night. I didn't need to write anywhere. The full sermon dropped. And this morning I'm preaching it. What's your walk with God? I am his living temple. I'm God's living mobile shrine. That's what you are. You are God's mobile shrine. And you have been giving the the rare the special privilege of watching ministering in this temple so you see it's a privilege and that means you should take it seriously right that means you shouldn't take it for granted that's what we are talking about my body is god's mobile shrine Hallelujah this morning. So the gift of Christmas is that he made you God's mobile shrine. You are God's sacred temple. Instead of shouting, thou shalt not commit fornication, thou shalt not commit adultery. Why not shout into their ears, you are God's mobile shrine. You are God's sacred temple. That's all you need to tell them. It was in the Old Testament they need to tell them God was trying to change them. In the New Testament, God wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to reveal you to yourself 
and preserve you. When you shout, thou shalt not commit fornication, you are scaring them and telling them they are, they are inadequate. When you tell them that they are the temple, their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you empower them because you put them in a place of importance. Mm -hmm. And then they now say, ah, my body is the temple, I won't allow anything to stain it. Glory to Jesus. Are you seeing the difference? One of them makes them the victim. Give them the message of a victim. Somebody that is under attack, they pray. But the other one give them the message of a predator. They are the one that is in charge. They are the ones that can protect. Do you understand that? Now, it is the man that is not the juju priest that is afraid of the shrine, not the chief priest, not the juju priest. Are you getting the point? Mm -hmm. The man that is not the juju priest is scared of the shrine. The juju priest is very excited. He will protect that shrine with his life because he feels he's empowered. Tell them their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit instead of telling them not to commit fornication. Because that wasn't the message. The message was not to tell them not to commit fornication. The message was to tell them, you don't know who you are. That's why that one happened. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you had known who you are, if you had known who is it, what you have done now, you just polluted what you are asked to protect. The enormity of defiling that temple, you might lose the occupant inside and that will cost you eternity. You see, this gives a deeper message. It puts them in a place of power. It gives them responsibility to say you are in charge. You can do it. For example, any person who is ordained, appointed a priest, instantly you feel power has been given to you, right? Their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Tell them that. And tell them they are God's high priest. Yeah, they've been given that, uh, that ability to minister in that temple on behalf of the God who sits in that temple. So, why do we think, that's why it's not everything you pray for. Oh God, where are you? Come, he's with you. Praise God. Hallelujah. In him you live and move and have your being. Your body is his temple. That's where he stays. The beauty is that God doesn't go on holiday like, the, like Bab. Who Elijah was saying must have traveled or is, is on a journey. Or is going to hunt. Our God is everywhere at the same time. Glory to Jesus. Amen. That's the mystery. It's in heaven right now as we speak. And it's inside of me. It's inside of you. It's inside of every one of us at the same time. Don't, uh, don't assess it through your head. It will blow up. Glory to Jesus. Amen. That is why we do not uh, assess the Bible through our head. We assess it through our heart. It's not by reasoning. It's by believing. Belief goes to your heart. Then through that, your mind is renewed, enlightened. The man in the mirror. What I've just done, I've created an imagery for you. To see that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Wow. Your body is his temple. He dwells in you permanently. So, but let me show you one scripture that says what you see when you stand in the mirror. And I'll bring this sermon to a close. Christmas message this morning. Ungodliness. The privilege of Christmas. You see, without Christmas, we would never experience godliness. Without Christmas, the birth of Jesus, we would never experience. We would never have had access to, to godliness. Because God now manifests in our flesh. God manifests now. So don't you see the stupidity in those denominations who's, who, who condemns the flesh, who feels you need to torture the flesh. You don't need to do anything to your flesh. You don't need to rub cream. You don't need to take care of your flesh. They are stupid. Because the duty of the chief priest, of the juju priest, is to ensure the shrine is beautiful. Right? Knowledge. They know not, neither will they understand Knowledge. Knowledge is very critical, very crucial. So why do you, don't you see that you are doing a disservice to yourself and to God inside? Beautify your temple, put on the best of clothes. That's what I'm saying. That's not godliness. The godliness is that God dwells inside you. Take care of the shrine. 
Glory to Jesus. Amen. Take care of God's mobile shrine. That is your body. Take care of it. Feed it well. Put on the best clothes. Put on the best jewelry. Put on the best shoes. Put it inside the best of house. The best of cars. The best of business. The best of... Are you getting what I'm saying? It is your responsibility. That is God's temple. Beautified. Just imagine a church building that was never painted. No wonder these days we don't have problem carrying God to uncompleted building. Because we don't have a sense of responsibility. No sense of responsibility. That, that is the almighty dwelling inside of you. I cannot worship him in an uncompleted building. It's disrespect to him. That is my personal belief. That's my personal take. It's a disrespect to him. Finish the temple, dedicate the temple, and they start using it. That's what they did. Once they dedicate, then they start using it. And the glory of God comes. But it's temporary. Now you have it permanent. So feed it well. Let me start wrapping up with what I started with. In heaven, the most, the worthiest man on earth, this entire fortune will not be as costly as the clothes you'll be wearing in heaven. So what are you talking about? So after they have told you to go and buy Okrika, secondhand clothes, you finish wearing all of them here. I'm sure some of us want to reject the clothing that, that will be given to us in heaven. Because then you will now see that your pastor deceived you. You entered one chance. Because he said expensive clothes was a sin, right? Now you are seeing gold. Go and look at Revelation. He said white linen. From, you, you, from the head to toe, you won't see where it is woven. White glistering linen that you can't find in the market here. The best of the best. The very ground you walk on is made up of pure gold. Check that. How much is the wristwatch of gold you use here compared to an entire street made up of gold? Are you getting what the apostle is saying? So, don't let your pastors deceive you. I'm talking to deeper lifers, especially. You should rise up. You should rise up. Don't church change yourself. Because some of you will be uncomfortable in heaven for a while. Praise God. Hallelujah. You will see prosperity like you have never imagined existed. The wealthiest believer on earth, when he dies, he will be intimidated by what he sees in heaven. Not to talk or so help yourself. It's just that it's in eternity. Otherwise, some of us would have died several times first before we we'll come to terms of where we are. Because some like, no, 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 where is this? No, 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 this is sin. No, 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 this is not right. Why? Because some of us, our pastors are damaging our psyche. They are not preparing you for heaven. They are rather preparing you for hell because... The way they make you dress, make you look, that is hell. It look more like hell. Because then, the Bible never mentioned gold. The Bible never mentioned jewel. And your pastor says you don't need all these things. So I think he's likely preparing you for hell than heaven. Praise God. I didn't say it, it is your pastor. It is your sermon. Because if he tells you you can't put on jewelry, you can't put on gold, you can't put on beautiful clothes, all of these things are in heaven. It's only in hell they are not. Then you now conclude. I think it's preparing you for hell. You should rebel. You should rebel. Glory to Jesus. Amen. So let me show you what you see in the mirror. When you look in the mirror. The man or image in the mirror. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 16 to 18. Nevertheless. When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. It, it, it was talking about comparing the law and grace. That up to now, when you read the law, there is still veil over it. Something is still not clear. Uh, because it is called shadow. It is called, it is called shadow. It is grace that is the substance. And I've told us in this church, you cannot identify a person through their shadow. Now, the Lord is that spirit. Did you see that again now? Oh, uh, uh, have you seen it now that there's no difference between Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God? 
What does 17 says? He said, now what? He said, the Lord is what? Is that spirit. That's why Isaiah 9 verse 6 gave him all the titles for the three of them. The three manifested. Because they are not three. It's one that manifests itself in three different forms. The Father, the Spirit, and the Word. And the Word became flesh. That's when he took the name Jesus. And forever, he's, he's, he remains Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Now, the Lord is our spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So, when you are in a denomination, in a congregation, today is Christmas. Now, some are fooling themselves. Every Christmas, they go for a retreat. They are always among themselves. Why are you going to show love to the world? Yeah. When will you show love to the world? Every Christmas, you hide. You pack yourself and go and be with yourself. Are you not fooling yourself? You spend three days. You come and spend the whole year with these same people. You are fooling yourself. Right? Why not you migrate them so that they don't go to work anymore? Huh? Migrate them so they don't go to market too. Oh, you want to carry them for three days. Then later they go to the market. And jump into public bus. Right? Whereas well, that day you are supposed to share love among your neighbors. But you would have done all your eating in your camp alone by yourself. Then you come back after Christmas is over. After all the celebration is over. And then you greet your neighbor, good morning. Shame on you. I'm showing a side that we are not seeing. No wonder Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciple. If you have love one for another. There are Christians in that your same compound that are not in deeper life. That you, you run away so you don't give gift to them. So you don't share love with them. And the unbeliever in that company is watching you. Every year, that's how you run away. In, in the name of camp. You run away. You come after everything is over. You are a selfish Christian. You don't know what it means to be a Christian. Then all through, you live your life with the same neighbors. The year you holler. They, they are in need of something. You have it. You hide it. Huh? Godliness. It's not the clothes you wear. It is the one who dwells inside of you. It's God manifest in the flesh. That is godliness. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Free yourself. But we all, he didn't say some of us, everyone who is born again, but we all with open face, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Did you see that? Even as by the Spirit of the Lord, the Lord is our Spirit. We are changed from glory to glory. Beholding us in a glass, what? The glory of God. So the man in the mirror is God's glory. Why won't it be God's glory when your body is his temple? So the only thing you see is glory. So let people... I pity those who your pastors, who your ministries tell you that you are worthless, you are wretched, there's nothing in this body, the flesh should be dealt with. They are lying to you. Your body has become God's shrine, God's sacred edifice. So you should take care of it. Take care of it very well, oh. Take care of it. Don't make it, don't make God's shrine, God's temple a caricature. Don't make it like a refuse dump. Put on the wave on. Put on. Just dress. That's you. Your reference, your gratitude is determined by the individual. How you want to express that gratitude. That is your business with the Holy Spirit. Nobody should write a handbook for how you should express your gratitude to God. It is wrong. They don't have that right. No pastor have that right. Your gratitude, your reference to God is between you and him. But make sure you take care of that temple. Eh? On a Christmas day like this, beautify it with smile. Beautify it with clothes. Beautify it with whatever. Beautify it with love. Spread it. Let it spread. Dress well. Look good. Look nice. Smell nice. That's just it. You can't be smelling. Instead of giving sweet aroma. Hmm? The heaven you are going to have all precious stones. Here yeah, you can't even put on wristwatch. Don't you see something is wrong with you? Precious stones, pure gold. Those are the things in heaven. Yeah, they say it's wrong for you to, to put on 
gold. Even fake, fake gold. They don't allow you. So how will you survive when you land and you see the street is gold? How do you survive it? Let's write up for our feet. Christmas. The mystery of godliness. What a time in his presence.